this is what I'm going to talk about. It's going, not going to be a, as conceptual and theoretically driven as perhaps, uh, as perhaps was billed. Uh, that may be a relief to some of you. Uh, but I'm going to start by looking at some country examples. Um, Ethiopia, where I uh, was up until last night. Um, China, emerging allocation issues. And then something about managing allocations allocation approaches, and then a few conclusions. So firstly, Ethiopia. I've drawn a couple of circles around there. Um, I also, I'll speak loudly, brought a copy of the esteemed Ethiopian Herald, which I uh, bought on Sunday. Let me read this little piece out to you. Addis Ababa, Prime Minister Mele Zanawi, said yesterday that the intensified march of the Ethiopian people for development has defied the intent of destructive forces to turn Mescal Square, that's the big square in town, into Tahir Square. <laughs> A reference, of course, to the Arab Spring. This year's May the 28th, which was the anniversary of the over overthrow of the puppet Soviet regime, this year, May the 28th, was celebrated more colourfully than ever for the construction of the Grand Renaissance Dam which is a monument and model of our struggle towards Renaissance. So, National Day completely taken over by talk of the new dam. Over here, on the Blue Nile as it goes through into Sudan, with huge public support. And as an interesting question of political economy, I always ask, why it is the public are so vexed and mobilised on Dams, and why it is that the 50 million rural Ethiopians who don't have access to safe water isn't a source of public agitation or debate or politics of any kind. Nonetheless, a general point made by others, I think roughly 50% of the Earth's land area is in an international river basin. So over 260 major or 260 major rivers shared by over two nations. And that doesn't include the shared groundwater basins. Now, Ethiopia claims that this will bring benefits to its downstream uh, neighbors, as, of course, upstream riparians always claim in terms of smoothing flows and protection from droughts. It will, of course, contribute massively to Ethiopia's energy production. In fact, Ethiopia intends to export electricity to other countries. So this is seen as a big money earner. And interestingly, the Ministry of Water is now the Ministry of Water and Energy. And water, basic water supply, has slipped right down the political agenda. Of course, one of the reasons people are the dam debate and the storage debate is coming back at the moment is because of graphs like these which for Ethiopia show rainfall variability linked with GDP, or in this case, the numbers in need of food aid and rainfall. The argument being that since Ethiopia hasn't reached a minimum platform of hydraulic infrastructure, particularly around storage, it is vulnerable to climate variability. Uh, and of course, uh, it is, although you will note that this latter bit, which is missed out of many reports, shows essentially a decoupling of the economy away from rainfall. And the storage debate, as I've said, doesn't include groundwater. Groundwater is the biggest store of water. We know very little about those conditions. and we, In fact, we know very little about what will happen to groundwater as a, as a result of climate change. We had a great talk, I thought, on foreign direct investment in uh, land and therefore water. Great example from Ethiopia. I took this one uh, the other day, uh, but I had to run away because there was a man up here with a gun and uh, he did not like me taking photos. I would assume that in theory that massive greenhouse has a right. In theory it should have because of course water is publicly owned and the public the state grants rights of use. What happens in practice? I don't know, and it's very difficult to find out. Competing demands, well, two pictures here. I mean, one flood condition, one um, uh, 
uh, not flood, but you see here the growth of small-scale irrigation on the back of on the back of a river. And this is still one can see these tensions coming to the fore in the future between sectors. We've had figures for Africa saying, you know, maybe, I mean, it's guesswork, maybe 5%, probably less, of cultivated land is irrigated. Ethiopia, it's probably much less. So, the argument goes, we need some kind of green revolution for sub-Saharan Africa in the same shape or form that we saw in Asia. Well, if irrigation really does take off, and it's a big if, then that will, of course, raise concerns about who gets what, and particularly tensions between agriculture, which is the big withdrawer and consumptive user, um, basic needs, and the environment. But Ethiopia is not there yet, and this graph really shows you the massive difference in irrigated land area between Africa and Asia. I'm going to switch to um, China now. You'll see uh, parts of China, uh, India, North India in particular, very darkly coloured, ind indicating very intensive irrigation. And here the big allocation or the big management challenge is really not around the development of water to meet basic needs, as it is in, I believe, sub-Saharan Africa, in, in Ethiopia. It's about agriculture and how it loses market share to other sectors, as it will inevitably have to do. Agriculture in China takes around 70% of water. It's the biggest consumptive user of water, and there is a lot of innovative work going on at the moment, looking at ways in which farmers' incomes can be protected and production can be maintained, because China, of course, has an unwritten policy of maintaining 90, 95% basic self-sufficiency in grains. Um, how to maintain rural incomes and farm production while liberating water to other sectors. Now, how does it do that? Arguably, China is, in a way like India, or some other parts which have experienced a real boom in irrigation, a victim of its own success in that irrigation development has been so phenomenal, particularly since the advent of motorized pumping, that the environment has not been considered a legitimate sector or a legitimate user of water. And we now have these tensions between growing urban areas um, and industrial users in the new economy and the old users um, in irrigation districts um, in particular. So this irrigation district, which is only something like the third largest in China, irrigate, would irrigate a good chunk of Germany, put it that way. I mean, these districts are massive and take several days to drive from one end to the other. I mentioned the um, China as a victim of its own success. I mean, you can see this if you look at what's happened to the Yellow River, when in the year in 1997, I think it was, it actually stopped flowing to the Bohai Sea. Uh, and this became something of an emblematic event. Now, the cause of this, some of it is climate related, but the major cause of this is irrigation withdrawals. Increasingly, towards the latter half of the 90s, it's urban and industrial use. And that environmental flow, which previously was seen as, a leg as an illegitimate residual, is now really coming to the fore because, of course, when the Yellow River doesn't flow, carries a lot of sediment, 10 times more than the Ganges. It builds up and you have water levels two, three meters above the surrounding population. So massive flood risks. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, briefly, about the allocation system, because in northern China, you actually have a lot of interesting experimentation around allocation. It's based around rights. Any talk on pricing, trading, technical measures we heard about, administrative rationing, is predicated on having a basic system of water rights in place that define, through a planning mechanism, how much you have to allocate, and through a regulatory mechanism, how much you're going, you're going to portion out to different users and which instruments you are going to allow to function to allow some shifting of water around the edges. But the basic system of water rights has to be in place. 
And you can see how it works out in China. Inner Mongolia. So this is done through a river, a river basin master plan. Inner Mongolia has 58.6. Uh, that's probably million cubic meters. It could be actually, yeah, million cubic meters. And these are the other regions and the provinces. And this is defined in an allocation plan that is adjusted annually according to prevailing conditions. So that's a formal right for an administrative area that feeds down, in this case, down into an irrigation district. I'm just looking at the irrigation district now. The legal part and the volumetrically defined part ends here. This is the formal right. Anything below this level has to be allocated through contracts and negotiation because, as the previous speaker outlined, individuals in most rural areas and on most surface water irrigation schemes do not have volumetrically flexible flows that they can turn on and off. It isn't a question of whether you agree with pricing or whether you don't. It's a question of irrigation schemes not being designed and engineered to deliver flexible flows that confront farmers with marginal costs. It's just out. So find another argument and another method and look beyond your usual Global Water Port Partnership toolkit is my argument. So formal rights down here, contracts and claims down here, and whether the claims of a household are met depends on membership of the Water User Association. It's not a legally defensible right, but it is still a right. So you have public sector ownership, ownership, public sector allocation up to a point, and then contracts and claims from this point onwards, but not based on direct volumetric allocation. That's the surface water picture. So very briefly, let's just quickly go over a few allocation foundations. I've said that, okay, we've all made the point that allocation is about reconciling the claims of competing users. Just a quick point here, it's not just quantity, it's quality and reliability. Reliability, the security of that right, is vitally important which is why we see rights in some places, Murray Darling, defined in two portions. Beyond an economic ideal, conceptual foundations, you don't need me to tell you that efficient, inverted commas, is about, to an economist, equalizing marginal benefits across uses and between users. Okay, but what values and whose values? And where does the environment come into that and how do we put a dollar sign against it? Or China's wish to maintain food self-sufficiency and equate that wrongly with food security, which is an entirely different thing. So the allocation of rights, I've tried to make the point here, underpins any allocation discussion. That's water rights. And the instruments that we've talked about, trading, pricing, administrative rationing down at lower scales, they follow. One contributor earlier on mentioned slow progress on integrated water resources management and they are dead right i think when the uh when that uh, uh 2002 world summit on sustainable development which all farmers all all countries undertook to develop iwrm plans and water efficiency plans so to date we have roughly 25 percent of countries have prepared those plans. So allocation is part of, so the logic goes, those IWRN plans. Why do we not see more of them? And why are they so difficult to implement? I'll leave that one dangling. This is my version of the graph, which of course, as part of a highly strategic planning process, I developed uh, independently. Um, so I've got over the top allocative and productive efficiency, equity, ease of, implement, ease of implementation, and predictability of outcomes. I'd stuck in the predictability of outcomes as an, as, a, as, a, as an additional thing. As I said, my temptation was to write in bold across here, it depends. Because pricing, well, which particular type of pricing are you talking about? Administration, permits, certificates, tickets. Some of them have legal standing, some of them don't. Some of them are formal rights, some of them aren't. Trading, informal and formal. 
permanent and temporary, that's the P and the T, and technical interventions of the kind the previous speaker spoke about to increase water use R, that word efficiency and productivity. So that's my take. So let's take one. Trading, increasing the productive efficiency, yes, the big thing about trading is it's supposed to increase the allocative efficiency, yes, equity, it needs regulation, ease of implementation, formal trading is extremely difficult, predictability of outcomes is very mixed. Murray Darling, it took around 10, 15 years to define water rights to be able to trade. That is in a country with literate farmers, well-developed le legal systems, and excellent information on raw resource conditions and flows. Okay, so there's three reasons why you don't tend to find that kind of system in other countries. If you can think of 10, you're, you're starting to get there. But of course, informal trading occurs all the time. We had an example earlier, but in fact, the big private sector story with water, I would argue, is actually less to do with foreign direct investment and more to do with the birth of groundwater economies in Asia, which have been largely privately financed and occur beyond the reach and the mandate of public institutions, albeit with massive energy subsidies. In fact, if we were looking for the, for the kind of well nexus, here's a classic case where private investment in groundwater is bankrupting the Indian state electricity boards. What can the public sector do about it? Very little. Our models of water resources management here are predicated on having easily identifiable small numbers of users. But hang on, there are four million small farmers on the China, North China Plain. How on earth do you monitor and regulate the activities of four million farmers, each with less than two hectares? If they had less than two hectares in the Murray Darling, you wouldn't bother with them because they would just be small, insignificant users. The problem is, in the North China Plain or, it, or India, those small users account for all of your water withdrawals. So that's the management, that's the size of the management challenge. So we have to be a little bit cleverer about trying to think what to do about it. And sometimes simply recognize that managing water through these kinds of instruments in some areas and with some users is basically going to have very little traction and we should be looking at other means. Discuss. Here's a groundwater economy. I won't dwell on it any longer. This is North China. This is only 15 years old. Massive irrigation already. Metered farmers. Now there's a real rarity, uh, but in this case we put on water meters. That gives you some idea, the table a little old now, of the kind of challenge you get with groundwater just in terms of annual abstractions and the numbers of users and the differences you get between um, countries. And of course, in North China, water is publicly owned and theoretically the state grants use rights. De facto, it's privately owned and privately managed. So conclusions, scarcity versus security, we could discuss. The problem with scarcity at the moment is it's become a little bit too physically defined. Scarcity isn't. Competing claims, I've mentioned this quality and reliability issue. I've said allocation, if we're looking at that, we need to perhaps distinguish between the fabric and the instruments, and the fabric is having a basic water rights system in place. In practice, you get mixed systems. It isn't pricing or trading or allocation licensing. You have different things going on at the same time, but an allocation licensing system underpins most good systems. And finally, on a point of political economy, Water resources management literature is full of stuff about what we should be doing to improve allocations or improve the efficiency of use. We seem, to my mind, to have yet to learn the difference between what should be done 
and how an ideal model looks like and what can actually be done, which is determined by political feasibility, administration, basic logistics. Thank you.